country perspective and also uh, requiring international collaboration and partnerships, right? Um, just uh, want to use the example of the scam again, like from an organizational perspective. And I think um, over the years, uh, it's quite a common, well, there's quite a few common challenges for organizations to respond to and, and uh, protect and detect uh, some of these uh, cyber threats. There's a talent burden, so acquiring or retain, re re retaining skills, right? Uh, there's also the technical technical complexity, there's so many security vendors, solutions that you have to integrate. It makes it very difficult to have a holistic picture of what's going on in your organization. There's also the compliance burden whereby, you know, there's so many regulations that you have to respond to. So there's a lot of challenges for organizations to, you know, uh, to face. And what have you seen in the last, uh, you know, few years? Because we have quite a few high profile cyber incidents like supply chain attacks you know uh, ransomware groups have you seen like organizations uh, responding better of course they have been with all these high profile incidents over the last few years uh, I have to say yes and no um, there's more of an awareness among especially mm. most the um, let's say more developed uh, uh, organizations, the, the ones that are at least at more attuned to their risk profile and the things that they need to secure. So there is more of awareness in, in security in general, I think. But you're exactly right about um, uh, compliance and complexity of security, but also that just a lack of, of talent in the space. We need more people mm -hmm. um, in general in the space. So uh, again, like I, like I mentioned in the talk, we're still relatively new at this kind of response because these technologies didn't exist mm -hmm. 10, 20 years ago, right? So organizations are really trying to get a handle around, first off, the talent that they need to come in and then how to respond to that. And with the new technologies, more, uh, can I say, somewhat experimental security technologies are also coming in to try to solve different, different mm -hmm. business problems, right? right yeah. And as they come in, there's going to be complexity. So the, the organizations that are willing to take on that complexity um, will help determine the future of what security looks like because they are essentially the testing ground for these mm. new companies that are making these new systems, which we need, right? Mm -hmm. And that's essentially going to be a cost of doing business if you want to be on the, the edge of this. Now, the bigger issue I think that we have, again, going back, is a lack of human resources, uh, not only in the private sector, but also in the public mm -hmm. sector. We don't have enough cybercrime investigators or digital forensic That's experts. Right, yeah. And if we train these cybercrime investigators in law enforcement, mm -hmm. they can make a better salary in the private sector so they don't stay. They go mm -hmm. to private sector. So we have a huge retention problem overall. At the same time, criminal groups are using technology to scale their business. So we are not able to scale humans fast enough, mm -hmm. <laughs> essentially, right, but criminal yeah. groups can use these technologies to massively scale their business, and they have, and this is what we're seeing right now. Now, we will respond to it, but it's gonna take time, but in the meantime, people are losing their life savings mm -hmm. because we can't scale fast enough to, mm -hmm. to meet the problem. So you talk about in your talk as well that uh, humans, we need to see them, we need to see ourselves as assets in, in this uh, cyber sort of uh, crime and uh, combating this uh, wave of cyber crime. And a lot of us uh, at cybersecurity conferences, we tend to say that, you know, humans are the weakest link. Right, um, and of course, uh, because that's because, for example, due to phishing or social engineering exercise, and from a user's perspective, when it comes to uh, these kind of scams, there's a lot of uh, new sort of uh, technology and authentication methods that's pushed out by, say, for example, financial institutions, that could be quite challenging for users to catch up with, right? But there's no other choice because sometimes you know the bank is a digital bank. There's no sort of branch that you can go and you know do your transfer, so there is also a catch up. You know, we talk about a cat and mouse game between um, cyber criminals and uh, cyber defenders, but there's also a cat and mouse game between the users and all these uh, organizations pushing out the latest innovations. And you talk about it's more that needs to be done in terms of education. Um, I think there's more that needs to be done, not only in education. I think education. Educating people and raising awareness is always a good thing. If you can do that, if mm. you can invest that, it's always, it's always worth it because someone will have a change in behavior or be affected. It just depends on how you're approaching them and when you approach them, whether they're gonna be more open to it mm. or not. So I am a strong believer in education and awareness programs. Um, even if there's no immediate direct outcome, 
it's it's just turning the dial a little bit more, and we need to be always turning the dial. So 100% education awareness programs, I think, are, are worth it uh, in the long run. In terms of what I, what I really think needs to happen, though, is really this change in mindset about, for example, seeing a user as uh, a liability. Now, of course, there's risk with users because of the social engineering aspect and things like that. They are um, very often the vector that hackers can get into a particular network. So if you're thinking about it from an organizational perspective, you're saying, okay, I don't trust my users because they could be compromised. I totally understand where they're coming from. If we scale out a little bit, though, and you look at national security or security of a government, the people are the assets for that government, right? I mean, that's, that's literally the point of the government is basically to manage and, and hopefully make the lives better of these people. So we can't treat people like a, like a liability whenever you're really looking at the societal or, or overall mm -hmm. level, but we still do. We say, okay, I, I'm a government, I'm gonna put all these rules on uh, people and I'm going to try to control them just like we would in information security, kind of no trust model. Mm -hmm. They're going to access resources, but mm, I'm not really going to trust it. If we started seeing people as an asset, and what I mean by that is in information security, we protect assets. We identify the assets that we want to protect the most. We mm -hmm. put the most value to the assets, and then that's what we want to protect. When we see users as a liability, that's because we want to protect information mm. in our organization. That's our asset, because that's what's going to make us money. And that really comes from the perspective that any user is replaceable, right? So in an organization, okay, this user is mm. not performing. I can fire them. I get a new person. My assets are protected. But if you really see your users as an asset, or more importantly, see citizens mm. in a government as assets, now these are the things that we need to protect. How much should we be investing for that? That's really my point with seeing a user mm -hmm. as an asset. Now, along with your information, because information, no doubt, is, is one valuable. Like, that's how we make good decisions. But we can't just keep seeing everyone as a liability and then excluding them from the calculus of how we're actually going to secure mm -hmm. the organization. That's what I meant by asset. So we just talked about um, looking at uh, the cybercrime landscape from an organization perspective, from a user's perspective, from a government perspective. Now, looking at it from a cybercriminal's perspective, you say that they, some of these are organized crime. They invest a lot in security measures. How much do we know about their weaknesses and strengths that we are able to, you know, as cyber defenders, able to sort of take advantage of? I mean, there's, there's a lot of different groups working in this space. So, for example, there's, there's criminal groups that we would say are not organized. They're just kind of experimenting and they're just trying to get quick cash or whatever, or they're just learning into the systems. So I, I would classify it into kind of unorganized groups or individuals that are trying to just start doing something yeah. <laughs> okay and then organized crime groups that are either new or are older and well established the older well established groups normally have ties to things like drugs um, uh, human trafficking they've already been doing different types of crime and they're adding cyber crime to their portfolio right because they want to diversify in case one one mm -hmm. revenue stream goes down basically so they work like businesses really um, and then there's um, essentially government and nation state actors mm -hmm. as well. So uh, most governments now, I would say, um, at least are, are having the idea of a cyber military or some sort of um, ability to, to do military operations in cyberspace. And that is really difficult to discern between crime and like military practice. So there's a lot of different groups in the space. Um, try not to get involved in the military side <laughs> yeah. at all because um, that's, that's way beyond uh, uh, what UNRDC does. But really with the organized crime groups especially, um, they have uh, very well established channels, right? And they are, so are also normally well resourced because of all of the, because mm -hmm. they're treating it like a business. So they're well resourced, they have the money, they have the infrastructure in place and they don't want to lose that infrastructure so they invest a lot in security of that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And they're using exactly the same tools and methods and best practices that we use right, yeah. because that's how you secure things, right? So um, these, these criminal groups um, are, just think of them exactly like a very large business. Mm -hmm. um, and they will, do, they will invest where they need to invest mm -hmm. to make sure that their assets are protected. 
So they view uh, security investments as ROI as well? Of course, of course. Everything mm. is ROI. Everything mm. is ROI. And it's also very cold. So they don't, they don't necessarily have to care about their employees at all either. They care about, can this money laundering channel be maintained over the long period? Like those kind of things. So um, yeah, everything is an ROI evaluation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For, for the successful organized crime groups. Mm -hmm.